Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Now I will let you take it away. Okay. So um, I was asked to give this talk about growing roses organically. I've been growing roses for much of my life, which to me is kind of interesting in that when I was young, um, in my teens, I loved gardening already. And there were two things that I really disliked. And that was orchids and roses. And the minute I started actually getting into the business and I, when I started working at Smith and Hawken, I actually became their orchid expert. And then roses became a specialty of mine. And it's, it's all from having my own garden and realizing that both of these things were, I had a, I had a certain mindset about them and it was an entirely, at least on my part, a, a mistake. I always thought that roses were grown in little rose ghettos all by themselves looking very ugly. The plants were tortured, spiny looking things with great big blousy looking flowers. Well, anyway, I changed my mind about both things. So um, <laughs> I also changed my mind about how to grow them. So I'm gonna talk about growing roses organically or mostly organically, or as organically as possible. And that sounds a little wishy-washy, but it brings to mind, um, I, I borrowed the phrase of calling myself a PMO gardener, and that is pretty much organic. And that means there are times when I will use products that are not organic. It's very rare. I will talk about that towards the end of the, the talk but it also reminded me of uh, Venus Williams was taught, the tennis star was talking about she and her sister that they were vegans and she paused and she said, actually we're Cheegans. And the interviewer said, what is a Cheegan? And she said, that's a cheating vegan <laughs> because they wanted a cheeseburger every once in a while. So um, my organic rose growing is a a little bit like that. It's not that I cheat, it's that occasionally you do have to reach for something that you might not necessarily wish to use, but I do my best not to. So yes, at one time I was known for not liking roses, but it was in the cards that I would end up growing roses. This is my grandmother, this is my dad's mother, and this is actually the garden that I'm growing things in now. She's standing in the front yard where there used to be what passed as lawn and standing with her roses. And as I say, yes, she's smiling. <laughs> so, um, and uh, this is probably before I was born, this was taken. So it was, as I say in the cards, I would end up growing roses. So, one of the things when I started working with roses and, and by the time actually I had left uh, Smith and Hawken and, and uh, started working at Hortus, I was put in charge of ordering the Beirut roses for Hortus um, in the last about five years that Hortus was in operation. Uh, I ordered all the roses in from about eight different vendors. So it was really wonderful and I actually decided I needed to learn about roses and you know where they came from, how they were grown, how they were grafted and all the rest of it and, and about the breeding of roses. And it helped me to understand how they grow. So learning the history of roses can actually teach you a lot about how they actually grow and what they need, what their needs are. So I actually, I've, I've found that myself kind of fascinated with this and I'll there's a couple of books I can recommend if you want to track them down one is the first one is Peter Beale's classic roses it's a wonderful book uh, taking you through kind of the history of rose breeding and the other one is the second book called the rose by David Austin and it's it's mainly about his hybrids but it's also about the way we got to where we are with most of the other cultivars grown in gardens. So it's fascinating reading to, to um, find out about how we got from wild 
the wild roses of like the English countryside, the dog rose and things like that to where we are today. And so most wild roses look like this. They're five petals. Um, they're open flowers, mainly in shades of pink or white. And they are once blooming. Uh, some bloom for a fairly long season in late spring and early summer, but um, the reblooming roses were uh, introduced in the 18th and early 19th centuries after plant, uh, plant hunters, excuse me, had come back from China with roses that were reblooming. They would bloom again in the fall. And this, uh, the bloodline was kind of built into all of today's modern garden roses by um, endless breeding programs. The French mainly started this. The English took it up afterwards, and then uh, it's it's moved on from there. But uh, learning how these were, you know, put together original or, or bred originally has really helped a great deal in understanding how to grow things. I also realized putting this talk together, <laughs> that picture on the right is a bit of a cheat. That's actually, even though it looks like a wild rose, it's a modern rose called Lida rose. That's really an excellent, uh, an excellent plant. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about single flowers. So, with modern garden roses, and I include things like the one on the right there, Grusan Aachen, which is uh, actually from the turn of the last century. Uh, and that's one of the, probably one of the first modern roses, um, along with the, the uh, tea roses, not hybrid teas, but the teas. And they were called remontant or reblooming roses. And if you just planted them in a fairly decent soil and gave them water and didn't go about like with any heavy fertilizing or anything like that, they would normally bloom in spring for a, they would cycle through a few times of bloom in the spring and would probably rebloom again at, on a smaller, just maybe one or two uh, flushes of bloom in the fall. And they would rest through the summer, through the hotter months when they were getting less moisture. So their natural inclination is to bloom in the spring and the fall. And really, when I'm gardening, that's what I'm aiming for. I really don't push my roses heavily uh, to bloom at other times. I'm going to go through the entire year the way I treat my roses. Um, in just a, a few more slides, we'll talk about that. But as, as I put here, naturally, they would, you'd get flushes in the spring and again in the fall with possibly a little repeat during the summer. So most of our modern garden roses are grafted roses. This is a borrowed image uh, there, but uh, it's showing the graft union. What they do is they grow a rootstock rose and in the West, on the West Coast particularly, it's Dr. Huey, which is a variant of Rosa Wycheriana. It's actually um, a, a rambler. And for anyone who's either had an, a rose die or you've had suckers take over, you'll know that this rose is, it's a rampant grower. It has a huge late spring flush of cherry red kind of blossoms with a white heart to them. And immediately after it flowers, the whole plant gets mildew. So um, it's not the greatest rose to grow for decorative purposes, but it's a workhorse as far as the roots go. So they graft uh, growth eyes or growth buds onto uh, a Dr. Huey rose. And once the growth eye begins to form the new rose bush, they actually cut off the, the Dr. Huey and it is a high, I mean, uh, it's kind of a, <laughs> a Frankenstein, for lack of a better word, of, of two plants. You've actually um, created that graft union and then lopped off the top of the one that is the, the rootstock. And you do need to watch for suckers. And you can see that on the left, there's an underground sucker coming up. But you can also have above ground suckers. And it is best to cut these off, if possible, to get down as deep as you can and cut them off. Uh, don't just pull them or, or um, cut them off with a pair of pruning shears. If you actually get a weeder and snap them off, it's much better to get them off underground. 
Uh, just one, one quick thing here. If you do get into growing roses that aren't just the general ones available through the big box stores and um, the, the roses that are easily available in some of the, the better nurseries, you, if you get into ordering roses online, it is worth tracking down own root roses, roses grown on their own roots. They take a lot longer to establish, but once they are established, they're nearly indestructible. They are much, much better growers than grafted roses will ever be. And uh, I've noticed lately that if you go and get iceberg roses at a place like Home Depot, Almost always they're growing on their own roots. They're no longer grafted versions of iceberg, which everyone kind of is disdainful of because it's everywhere, but it's still one of the greatest roses ever produced. It's an astonishing plant on, in its own right. So what do roses need? Um, as, as far as food goes, uh, the basic components of any rose food, organic or inorganic, are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They call that the NPK ratio. And that's uh, listed on the packaging. Now, one of the questions that came in before this started was from Paul. And um, he was asking, it was a two-part question, what month do I stop fertilizing roses in the winter? I'll get into that when I go through the year. And also, could I recommend a rose food to increase the girth of cane growth during the dormant season? I'll talk about the treatment I give roses at the end of the season, or actually at the beginning of the season, really, what's just coming up. Uh, very soon. I don't recommend any particular brand of rose food whenever I'm giving talks. I don't like to do that. As long as it's organic, I just, I use fully organic rose foods and it's the OMRI um, certified organics. You'll find that it's the OMRI certification is always stamped on the, the front of the packaging. And that does certify that all parts of the food are organic or organically produced. And you have to be careful with this. There are rose foods out there that you'll see the word organic listed on it. And then if you actually start to look at the label carefully, you'll realize that half of what they're selling you is not organic. And the reasons that I actually switched to organics were it was, just noticing that things were changing in my garden. I'm, I'm going back almost 30 years when I started growing a lot of uh, roses and other plants. And I was using pretty much your off the, off the shelf basic uh, water soluble nitrogen salt fertilizers that are produced by burning fossil fuels. And thinking nothing much of it until I realized that my soil was changing. Um, I seem to be building up salts in the soil. Uh, my plants were getting chlorosis a lot more often. They were growing fantastic at first for the first year, and then they weren't growing as well. It seemed to me that they weren't growing quite as well. And I noticed that there were fewer earthworms when I was digging. Well, it got me to look into all sorts of things as to why this could be and what the differences were. This was about the time I was working at Hortus as well. And what kind of pushed me over the edge was once someone brought in a growth from, it was probably in the late spring, and they brought in a three or four stems off of a rose, and it was the, the new cane growth. And it was grayish purple with uh, strange like curled leaves and none of us wanted to touch it. It really looked, it, it really looked horrendous. We didn't know what it was. Well, finally someone on staff started asking questions and they realized that the person was using systemic rose food and they were using it at about five times the rate they should have been. And if, inorganic rose food was doing certain things, at least uh, what I found in my, on my soil, the, this systemics are doing it at a much higher rate because what they're doing is putting poisons into the soil to turn uh, 
a non-toxic plant toxic so that things won't eat it. Do systemics have their place? Of course they do. And um, you know, for anyone who's battling all of the, the things happening to trees and other stuff, systemics do have a place, but I don't think as a regular regimen for the garden that they're necessary. I don't think so. I'll talk a little bit about that um, coming up with the, when I talk about the things I use and how I keep my soil as healthy as I can. By the way, that rose on the, the right, that's Catherine Merme, and that is, that's a tea rose, not a hybrid tea, but the tea roses were uh, late in the 1800s and the early 1900s. They were extremely popular, and this particular one was grown in hot houses all over the United States. And if you look at old photographs and you see anyone clutching a great big armful of roses with long, long stems, that's this rose. It's Catherine Mermay and it was grown, it was a, a huge uh, uh, part of the, the, indus, the floral industry in the United States. These, you can actually cut stems about a foot and a half long on this. It's a uh, unlike most of the teas, which have short little stems, this one's a real winner for cut flowers. Um, so this is my disclaimer, because talking about organics and inorganics can be a little bit of a minefield. So I just wanted to say I'm presenting things as I've found growing roses organically, or nearly so for almost 30 years. Um, that your results may vary. I'm not growing your roses unless you pay me. And I'm in the midst of pruning about five rose, different rose gardens for different clients. And this is the time of year when I really say sometimes that I hate roses <laughs> when I have to do this kind of work. I'm doing it all alone this year too. So it's even harder. Um, if I make sweeping general it, generalizations, they say life is too short not to generalize, but um, I try not to. And I occasionally wear lemurs on my head, and so what's your bag? Anyway, that's my disclaimer. So one thing is for certain, um, organics are slower, and I'll talk about how and why. If you switch over from using inorganics it's going to be messy for the first year. The adjustment period can be a little shocking. You'll have totally different results uh, because your plants are almost addicted to the immediately available nitrogen in, in inorganic fertilizers. And you will have problems. There'll be a different set of problems than you had before. Uh, the rose there is Excellence von Schubert. And you can ask me about any of these things if you want to in the questions. And if I don't get to them after the talk, I'll get to them uh, in email. So I know that on that picture, that isn't rose foliage, but it was the best picture I could find of aphids. This is one of the big complaints about growing roses is that you get aphids. I don't get many aphids on my roses. I still have over 35 rose bushes. I, you, you know, I treat them organically. They grow a lot slower than they did when I was feeding them inorganic rose food. The, um, when you feed a plant uh, inorganic fertilizer and it has immediately available nitrogen, the plant is forced to take up that nitrogen. There is, it has no way to stop that. There, there are no gates for this. The plant has to draw that nitrogen up from the soil. And most inorganic fertilizers have way more nitrogen than the plant actually needs to grow in a, in a healthy manner. It's force feeding them quite a lot of nitrogen. And the only way they can deal with that is to grow new tissue and grow it very quickly. So they pump all of that nitrogen into those new canes. So you get this lush growth that looks fantastic, but it's very soft for one thing. And it's storing a lot of nitrogen, available nitrogen in there. And that's how the bugs find the plants. They can actually sniff this out. So if your plants are growing slower and pulling up nitrogen that is actually breaking down in a more 
uh, in a in a long over a longer period of time the way it does with organics. Most organics, when you look at their component parts, there's some immediately available nitrogen, but it's a very small percentage of that part. The rest of it isn't available until it begins to break down. So when you're feeding with organics, you're not looking for immediate results. You're looking about six weeks down the line. That's you're aiming for about six weeks away. That's about how long it takes for, for with watering and with mulching. That's about how long it takes for the, for the um, nitrogen to get totally activated and for the plant to be able to pull up all of the other nutrients involved. So I get a, I do get aphids, but I don't get huge outbreaks like this. And when I do get aphids, I either just wash them off with a hose or I tend to rub them off with my fingers as I'm walking through the garden early in the morning, drinking my coffee. That's, that's my, my peace time in the morning. I just spend an hour or two in the garden. And um, if not, then the birds are usually taking care of things, birds and other bugs. It's a kind of a joy to walk through the garden and watch particularly flocks of bush tits coming through and eating all of the aphids off the undersides of the rose leaves. So. Um, if you leave them, you know, if they taste good, <laughs> and they will with organics, they'll taste much better to the birds and bugs that want to eat them, they'll get taken care of for the most part. And on the other side is one of the, the other insect, and I put problems in quotations, that's signs of a leaf cutter bee at work in the garden. And whenever I see this, I actually jump up and down. I've never seen the bee itself doing this but I do love finding the evidence of it. And what the, what the bee is doing is she's cutting out circles to line her nesting chamber and she spins a kind of web along with these circles of foliage, not necessarily just roses, but all sorts of different foliage and laying eggs all the way up, making little chambers in a hollow. Quite often you'll find it in a dead, dead branches or in like bamboo supports you put out in the garden, you'll find uh, leaf cutter bee nests. It's really, it's quite astonishing because they can, they can be about 10 or 12 inches of little layers of all of these things going all the way down. So that's, it's pretty cool. So in, in my experience, most of the problems are foliage problems with roses, um, black spot, rust, mildew, botrytis blight, and what we call rose slugs. And um, we are kind of lucky here. The black spot that we have doesn't tend to act the way black spot does in much more warm and humid areas. If you go to places like Texas or the Florida Panhandle, black spot can kill a rose in like a week. It's, it doesn't happen the same way here. We tend not to get horrendous outbreaks of things. Um, I also realized going back, I also realized I don't take enough pictures like this. I tend to take pretty pictures of nice stuff and I don't take pictures of problems. So when I want to talk about problems, I've got to go and steal a, 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 an image from somewhere. This is actually from the American Rose Society, the Gulf District portion, and it's giving you all of the things that can go wrong with your rose. Well, we tend to just mainly have black spot. We have what the aphids, they call it green fly there, which is more of a British term. Um, uh, and rose slug worm, which is interesting because it's neither a slug nor a worm. It's actually a larva of a um, sawfly. And it's, so it's a maggot. It's actually a, a it's, it's neither a, it looks like a caterpillar, but don't treat it as if it's a caterpillar. In fact, I don't even bother spraying when I find rose slug. I just squish them. I tend to look at the backsides of the leaves every morning when I'm out just doing my patrols and try and find stuff before it gets to be much of a problem at all. So um, there, those are some of the problems that can happen with your roses. Now, uh, a quick, just a quick mention, just in case this comes up in questions, there are two things, two very serious problems that I have not dealt with, I have never had it happen to me, nor has it happened in any of the gardens I tend. One of them is chili thrips, which 
has been happening in the drier, warmer areas out in the San Fernando Valley and up in Ventura. I know I gave a talk up in Ventura and about half the audience in that talk had chili thrips in their roses. And the other is rose rosette disease, which is really becoming quite a problem. If you are dealing with either of these things, I would actually tell you to go and do as much reading as you can online about them. And this is one of those situations where it may not be possible to treat it organically. Um, if it reaches a certain point, I think you do have to switch to something that's a little stronger. But I do think if you are growing organically, you're also probably, I'm, I'm guessing that you're probably at less of a risk for either of these things because your plants are just not growing so fast. They're not gonna be as much of a target for uh, the inside, for the chili thrips anyway. And cane borers, there are a couple of different culprits. There's a fly and also a wasp that both lay their eggs on the new cut ends of roses and their larva will, they're built to bore straight down into the rose cane. If you find this on any of your roses when you're pruning, you actually need to cut off until you, you find healthy solid cane. You have to keep cutting until you don't find any more hole. And if you find an active one, I would actually tell you to split the branch open and take a look at the thing that's doing the damage. It's really quite fascinating the way they're built. Uh, one of the ways to stop this, though, is to just go to the 99 cent store and buy some cheap chapstick and put chapstick on the end of your, the cut ends of your roses. Um, it's a simple trick. You can also use candle wax, but that tends to flake off. You need something that's a little bit gummy and will stay on the, 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 uh, the rose cane. And I happen to... I have only I have a few roses that it happens to every year, and one of them is Tom Carruth's Out of the Blue. It's a really great rose. I love growing it, but it seems to always get cane borer. I don't know what it is about this plant that is irresistible to the to the uh, insects that lay their eggs on the ends, but it seems to happen quite a bit. But as I say, you do need to take up the cane is not going to produce nice roses. It's actually going to be weak and can snap eventually. So it's better to just take it off and just prune it down until you don't find that hole anymore. So um, years ago, again, when I worked at Hortus, we were switching to organics in the nursery when Gary Jones made that announcement. We actually got a visitor from the Cranford Rose Garden at the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. And they were just, they happened to that year just be switching over to an organic program. And they still are to this day. I took this picture, these pictures many years later. I can't remember the gentleman's name. I'm sorry. I actually had his card for the longest time and I've lost it. But um, this rose garden is not entirely organic. And I, I've also visited the, um, the uh, AH, RS test garden up in Portland, uh, the American, I'm sorry, it's, no, the ARS, excuse me, ARS test garden, the American Rose Society test garden in Portland. And I was asking them about, you know, what they do with their roses and they're not, I can't remember if they were growing organically or not. I don't think they were, but they were trying to do their best to, to uh, keep the soil very healthy so that the roses would be healthy. And uh, one of their, <laughs> One of their things they told me was the guy pointed to the line of trees and he said, just over there past the trees is the Portland Zoo. And they let us go in and get the elephant manure out of the elephant enclosure and we bring it to the rose garden. So <laughs> if you have access to elephant manure, it can work wonders. I would actually tell you horse manure is just about as good too. If you live anywhere near Griffith Park or any other equestrian centers, you can probably get your hands on some horse manure. So. Water well, um, this, is, this is one of the things that works on my soil is learning how to, to water and learn how different soils take up water differently. I'm on heavy clay where I am. So when I water, it tends to, if I water properly, it tends to stay wet. I mulch, I do it lightly and at least twice a year. And what I mulch with is mainly dried leaves that I put through a chipper shredder. Um, it's my favorite tool in all the world. I have a, an electric chipper shredder and I pretty much shred everything I can and it goes right back out into the garden as mulch. Uh, 
um, stay on top of the problems by looking daily. And if a rose bush looks weak and it stays that way for more than a couple of years, get rid of it. It just doesn't pay to, to try and hang on to these things unless it's something, you know, if it's something you just must have, you might want to try moving it to a better location or something where you can probably baby it a little better. One of the things about about healthy soils, and it, it was a comment that stuck with me from a class that someone else was actually giving way back when in, in, in Hortus days when I worked there, someone was giving a class and they were talking about the soil and adding things to the soil, adding amendments and all the rest of it. And they said, you can only change the soil as deep as you can dig. And even then you're only changing it for the time that those amendments last until they actually decompose. So you really can't change whatever soil structure you have in any great fashion. You can change it a little bit over a long period of time, but the minute you stop, it reverts back to exactly what you had before. So I'm on heavy clay. It's always going to be heavy clay and I can mitigate that by treating it a certain way. And what I do is I mulch on a regular basis and I, I watch for things to, to uh, decompose. And also um, I tend not, not to dig. I don't actually cultivate the soil a lot. Once I get it in, you know, if I get my amendments in the soil at planting time, I tend to try and leave the soil without digging uh, in the future, I tend to add stuff from the top instead of digging it down in. It tends to uh, destroy your soil structure. And if you need a good example of that, go into any garden that's had problems with gophers and see where they bring up really, they bring up soil from very deep down. It's actually more dirt than soil. It's, and wherever gophers have been active, it's very hard to get plants to reestablish until you reestablish that decomposing organic matter back into the soil. It tends to disrupt the structure to such a point that it doesn't grow stuff very well. So keep your soil healthy uh, from the top down as much as possible without digging. And I think your plants will be a lot healthier. So all those roses are from my garden. I don't have some of those anymore. The ones on the right are gone, unfortunately. Um, Placement also matters. This was a garden in Central California that was almost entirely nat California native plants, but they put this uh, Sally Holmes up against a, a fence and it had its own watering system um, to water it at a different rate than pretty much everything else in the garden. And I just thought this was brilliant placement. So roses do need full sun or nearly full sun for they, the books all tell you an average of six hours a day. You can get by with a lot less if their shade is bright shade or reflected light and it isn't direct sunlight, but uh, I wouldn't try and put roses in shade. They just don't work. Um, that lighter rose that you saw earlier, the single pink one that I showed, that's actually listed as a rose that will tolerate partial shade and I started growing it in partial shade and immediately moved it out into the sun after I saw it growing uh, up in the central cemetery up in Sacramento where you can see some spectacular roses. I saw what it should really look like growing in the sun, so I moved it. Um, don't plant roses in the shade, it just really doesn't work. So I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. Going through the, the year in the rose garden, in November, I stopped deadheading roses and I let the rose hips form. And what this does is it signals the plant to slow down all of its growth. So it stops putting out new foliage, it will stop its new cane growth, and it will stop trying to produce as many flowers. It's just um, like any plant producing seeds, it's a signal for the, all of the growth to slow down. It's actually accomplished its goal for the year. Ah, the eochroma that we talked about is the big green plant in the background that's towering over my neighbor's house. So you can see how big eochromas can get. <laughs> I just realized that. Um, so again, stop deadheading in a, a, around about November. It doesn't mean you'll 
finished with flowers. I actually can still cut flowers for Christmas and New Year sometimes, but um, let them form some rose hips. So starting in late December, early January, I'm actually starting early this year because it looks like we're in this weather pattern for quite a while. So I'm just starting on roses already. Strip all the foliage, all of it. As I say, this is when you might consider giving up roses altogether, but strip it all and clean up everything off the ground. Most of our diseases of roses are foliar diseases and by keeping things clean, you'll actually go a long, long way towards not having these problems. This is not my rose garden, by the way. This is a garden I used to take care of. I don't anymore. You can see how pleasant some of these jobs were, like the nearly two-story tall som sombrui on the, on the uh, chimney on the far right there. That was always a joy. That took nearly half a day just to strip the foliage on that. Um, the reason I do this, I do this even with hybrid teas and floribundas. I'll strip all of the foliage before I prune. And some people may think that's a waste of time. I don't. I actually want to see the entire structure of the plant before I do any cutting on it. So I'll strip all of the foliage to take a look at how that plant is growing without all of the confusion of the leaves being right in the way. So, um, And a lot of the roses that I grow, I grow a lot of uh, David Austin English roses. I grow a lot of old roses and large shrub roses. And most of those do not need uh, a lot of pruning. In fact, the less, less pruning you do on them, the better they are, other than pruning out very old canes and shortening some of the crossing canes or, um, uh, you know, problematic things that, uh, that are growing straight up, the kind of water spouts that, that you'll get with no, no foliage or thorns on them. Uh, you want to take those out as well. So with modern hybrid teas and floribundas, I only cut by about a third. I've seen them all, you know, I go through gardens all the time where they've been cut down to stumps and I just feel like the plant has too much work to do after you've done something like that. I will usually not cut uh, most of the modern roses by much. It's just made things differently. This is just the way I tend to. And I love growing the plants that don't require a lot of pruning. Those are more of my favorites. So what I do when I'm done pruning is I side dress with alfalfa meal and sulpomag. Now sulpomag stands for sulfur, potassium, and magnesium. And it is, it's a natural product. It's actually mine that way. And it is called langbanite under different uh, packaging. And I've noticed that if it's called langbanite, you get less of it and you pay more for it. If you can find it as sulpomag, <laughs> you'll pay a lot less and it's the same exact thing. Now, alfalfa meal is a fertilizer, but it is so low in its available nitrogen, it doesn't start feeding the plant for probably almost two months. And also during the colder weather, it's actually going to just sit on the soil and start to become part of the soil rather than feeding. What it does do though, is it promotes new cane break. You'll get a lot of healthy canes growing if you use alfalfa meal. Mag, the sulfur, potassium, and magnesium make for better flowers, more flowers, and brighter flowers. The colors will be brighter. It is the same for anyone using like the biodynamic system. It's the same as using Epsom salts, except that Epsom salts are actually produced um, uh, inorganically and they are salts. The langbanite does not really make your soil as salty. So it's one of the things you may wish to avoid. Epsom salts are good on a limited basis, but not too much. So I, my, the first application of fertilizer, and I use, as I said, I use organic fertilizers. There's many, many different kinds out there. And as long as you check that it's completely organic, if that's the way you're going. Um, the first application I do is in March when the new growth that uh, you know, starts out bronzy or red, it starts to harden off and get a little bit green. That's when I'll actually apply my first true fertilizer. Now the alfalfa meal is already feeding it a little bit at this point but the first application of the uh, fertilizers in March. And remember, it's not, you're not gonna see the effects of that for almost another six weeks. So by mid-April, 
um, which is actually peak rose bloom. That's about when the, the fertilizers are really kicking in. Um, I've talked about the immediately available nitrogen and then the rest becoming usable as it breaks down. If also you feel like your plants aren't responding soon enough, you can actually feed them with a weak solution of uh, a liquid fertilizer at about this time, that's like fish emulsion or kelp. And um, so that can actually be helpful. So they say April is the cruelest month, but in the rose garden, it's our peak bloom. And they say that tax day, April 15th is actually supposedly peak bloom in the rose garden. Um, so there's some uh, old favorites there of mine. Uh, butterscotch is lower right, distant drums is upper right. That's a Griffith buck hybrid that's extremely strong growing. And then a weird rose called Rusty over on the left, which I had to get because that was gonna be my name <laughs> when I was born. Luckily, they didn't call me Rusty. Um, Monsieur Tillier and English Rose, and let's see. Yeah, there's a Guy de Maupassant, I think is the red one. So a lot of these roses have shorter stems for cutting. Um, I still cut them anyway. And remember when you're cutting a rose, you're pruning. So actually when you go to cut the rose, look at where you're cutting on the stem and try and find active growth facing outward, which would be at the, you know, at a leaf join, you'll see the active growth bud or the growth eye and try and cut so that what you leave behind is actually going to make for a stronger plant, stronger growing plant. So anytime you're taking flowers for the house, you're also pruning. So just be aware of that. I also, when I started growing a lot of English roses, I would watch the bees fumbling and fumbling through hundreds of petals trying to get down into the flower. And so I started growing a lot of single roses out of the feeling of guilt. So I would actually make a gentle plea for once blooming and for single roses in your garden. They're both really very rewarding. So, um, you can also email me for some good suggestions for what grows well in Southern California, if you'd like. I can give you some names of easy things to find and some that are more difficult, but very well worth uh, tracking down. So by summer, I'm scaling back. I actually stopped fertilizing my roses in June or late June or early July. And I also stop watering quite as much. Now they'll continue to bloom, but I don't push for more because really in my garden, the buds tend to just get scorched in July and August. And then I wait and in early or mid September, I start to fertilize again. And by late October, I'm actually cutting off fertilizing again. So you're really looking for that last, the big flushes of bloom in late November if you're fertilizing in October. So um, back to that question that was asked earlier is, you know, what month do I stop fertilizing? I tend to stop in October. This last year was such a train wreck. I don't even remember if I fertilize my roses or not. So um, they showed me their displeasure by not, <laughs> I didn't have a very good year in my garden. Um, I grew this rose for many years and it got rust for three years running. So I finally did what's called shovel pruning. I dug it up and I threw it away. I didn't even give it to someone I didn't like. It's a beautiful rose and in the right spot, it's a great rose, but not in my garden. It was very unhappy. So um, if, if a plant is getting the same problem over and over again, you know, in multiple years, consider just there's thousands of varieties of roses replace it with something else. So I will use manure. I use chicken manure all the time. I try not to use steer manure as much unless it's the only thing available. Steer manure has a much higher amount of salts in it than chicken manure does. I use a lot of compost. I have three compost piles going at the moment, but I do have room for that. I understand most, you know, most people probably don't, but I compost almost everything I possibly can. I've talked about my chipper shredder. I also use worm castings. If you don't have room for a compost pile, I use worm castings two or three times a year on roses in uh, clients' gardens, and I will do so on my own at, at certain times. Um, 
I talked about the the kelp or fish uh, food. I will. Uh, I haven't for years, but I will use neem oil or insecticidal soaps. If I get mainly, it's if I get an outbreak of spider mite, which can run rampant through a garden and is really one of the only problems that I consider even using any kind of spray at all is when I get spider a bad uh, outbreak of spider mite. If I'm growing in containers, I use Osmocote in the containers. And also one of the non-organic fertilizers I will occasionally use is if I see a rose bush that I really want to have do its best and it seems to be flagging a little, I'll use Magnum Grow. For anyone who knows who Dr. Tommy Cairns is, he was the head of the Tinseltown Rose Society, he developed Magnum Grow and it's a much for a non-organic rose food, it's a much gentler um, feeding. I don't use it as the label recommends. I'll only use it once or twice a year on plants that I think really need it, but it does have a lot of good trace elements in it. Um, so if you're gonna do any non-organic stuff, um, be careful. I need to wrap this. Oh, yes, yeah, that, that means I am wrapping this up. So if the big chicken shows up, that means I need I need to stop talking and take some questions. All right, Steve. Well, I know you didn't really like the name, but I think Rusty would yeah. be a nice name. <laughs> <laughs> but I have uh, two grandmothers, or both my grandmothers were redheads, and they both told my mother they would never speak to her again if they named me Rusty. <laughs> they, they both said he's going to have enough trouble as it is. <laughs> Well, Steve's also a nice name, so. <laughs> I guess. All right, Steve. So actually what I'm gonna have you do, I'm going to ask you to start your video just for the Q&A portion so that we can also see your face for a little bit. Um, so we'll get started with some of the questions. The first one is from Pat S who says, what variety is the rose on your title page? On the title page. Oh, that's Distant Drums as well. That was the very first rose that came up. Yes, that's Distant Drums. It's a Griffith Buck hybrid. It's a Floribunda and it is at its best. It is an unearthly shade of lavender and the heart of it is tan. It's like a buckskin tan color. I go for really bizarre colored roses. Not only is it strange, color that's really beautiful. It smells heavenly too, and it is a strong, strong grower. Any Griffith Buck Rose is going to get by in your garden with almost no problems at all, but that one is, that's easy to find. It's being grown locally and it's for sale locally, so it's not difficult to find. If you want some suggestions where to find it, you can actually email me if you want to give out my email. I think that's perfectly fine. I don't know if I should mention nurseries and stuff. I just don't know if that's really something we should do. <laughs> well, I'll make sure that we give your email in the Q&A PDF that we put up as good, well. So that good. if anyone has any questions, they can send it there. And I know we've already talked about your chipper and your shredder, but just again, we have a couple of questions already. Can you tell me the brand of your chipper or shredder, please. My Maybe chipper I'll... shredder is an old McCulloch, and it's the point point one nine horsepower, or something like that. And it's the old style with the with the feeder at the top. And I have not only do I have my old one, I was gifted another one by my friend who, when she moved, she gave me hers because she knew I loved it. So I actually have two of them. And I'm keeping them both in running order because they're wonderful. The newer chipper, electric chipper shredders, I don't think are as good. And so if you can find the old McCulloch um, chipper shredder, I'll, and for anyone, if they wanna contact me directly, I can try and give them the particulars on it. You may be able to still find it on Craigslist and things like that, so. Right, and I know this is also something you touched base on in your presentation. From Sylviana T, what months twice a year do you mulch again? I'm sorry, what, what, what? What months twice a year do you mulch? I tend to mulch a, a 
right about the time I put down my first uh, batch of fertilizer, uh, if there's any old mulch still on the ground, I'll kind of clear it away from the plants. I'll Sometimes I'll even pull up the old mulch, put it back through my chipper shredder and put it in a different part of the garden. And when I put down my first feeding, I'll put mulch over the top of it to keep it in place. So um, by the way, I also use coffee grounds in my garden. It helps acidify the soil, but not a lot. And only about two to three times a year on each separate rose bush. If you do more than that, you build up tannic acid. So in March, and then it, I'll check again, generally when we're going out of the June gloom in July or, or going, you know, going into about mid-July, generally I need to put down more mulch at that time just to keep the moisture in the soil because I'm watering less at that point and I need any water that I put down to actually be held in place and, and to do its job, so. Question is from Carol B. Uh, it is, what kind of mulch do you use and how are you defining lightly? So some of these I think were probably before you talked about. Uh, uh, the the chip, chipper shredder, I, you know, I'm, I have on my, either on my property or adjacent to it, I have a rubber tree, a loquat tree, and a magnolia. They're all gigantic leaves that do not break down unless you actually break them up. So I shred those up and I put down about an inch to an inch and a half around my rose bushes. It's probably more than that. I may be actually underestimating that a little, but I don't put down the four to, you know, three to four inches that a lot of books recommend. I tend not to mulch that heavily because I just don't, I want to be able to see the soil surface if I need to. I tend to pull the mulch aside and see what's going on down there. So I tend not to overdo it. And, and I will use commercial mulches or, or maybe not commercial. Uh, I will, if I use a, a, a mulch, if I need to go to, to anything uh, uh, on a larger scale, I'll actually go and buy it at one of the places where I can just fill up the back of my truck with a scoop of what they call compost, which in some cases is even like shredded um, pack, uh, pallets, you know, the, the, the wooden pallets. They shred those up and then they compost them for a while with some manures. And so the, they're very crude, but um, a lot of the books will warn you that they'll steal nitrogen from the soil. They're not stealing, they're borrowing. What they do is they'll actually pull nitrogen from the soil as they start to decompose, but then that gets reversed. They're putting back in much more nitrogen than they pulled from the soil to start the breakdown. So yes, they pull nitrogen, but then the reverse happens. They, the books never mention this, that, that really what's happening is an exchange and you need to be patient for it. All right, and then another question from Carol B. What is your technique for stripping the foliage? I tend to snap it straight down unless it's a plant that hangs onto its foliage like grim death. And there are a number of David Austin English roses that you cannot pull the foliage, you can't tug it off. And but that whole thing I do about letting the rose form hips, that tends to uh, signal the hormones to you know back up into the plant and it, what is it? called abscission or something, when they'll actually release the foliage naturally. There are a lot of rose bushes. You can go in and just kind of whack at them with a broom and they'll dump most of their foliage. But then there are some, like I say, some of the, the Austin English roses, if you try and strip the foliage by tugging at it, you'll actually tear the canes. And in that case, what I do is I hire somebody and I give them a good pair of pruning shears because <laughs> I get sick of it. It's, as I say, it's, it's the time, you know, tis the season for mumbled curses, torn clothing and uh, bleeding, you know, scratches. So, yeah. Your secret, all right. The next one is from Douglas H. Bouchard Gardens in Victoria, British Columbia cut back their teas to six to eight inches in winter. They bloom and put out foliage beautifully. I've seen so many roses that aren't cut back enough and they look so leggy during the growing season. How far back do you recommend for teas? Uh, 
Uh, as I said, my hybrid teas, I cut back only by about 30%. And I find that they mine do fine. Um, I understand that notion of cutting back harder on some of the modern roses. And <clears throat> I do think that here, the difference in what I do and what other people do, I think this it, it's bringing up something where this is my practice. And I think the reason is that I tend to grow my roses in with a lot of other plants. And so that legginess is actually, in some cases, working to my advantage. If they had foliage right down to the ground, I might be dealing with a lot more foliage problems, but I'm growing a lot of other plants in among the roses, so I don't notice it as much. Now, when I'm growing roses for other people, I do cut probably by about 50%, but I don't, when growing organically, I don't like stumping them down to that, that six to eight inches because they just have to work so hard to get back up to the point where they're gonna bloom. Um, you know, people, sometimes people seem to think that if you cut a rose down, you're going to keep it down in size. It, it, it's pre-programmed to grow. If it's a grandiflora, it's gonna get eight feet tall you're not stopping it, you're just slowing it down. It's not gonna change its habit by pruning it. So the, your pruning practices depends on how you grow your roses. If you have a rose garden that is just roses with bare soil between or a very small ground cover, you may wanna prune harder than I do. I tend, as I say, I prune a little less because I'm growing roses as a plant in amongst other plants. So it's, there's a difference there. Thank you, Steve. So we are almost at our 8.30 mark right now. So if anyone has to leave, uh, don't go, not just yet. I'm gonna give a, a couple of announcements. We're gonna do our raffle and then also we'll continue with the Q&A right afterwards. So first thing for our next webinar, it will be next month and we are actually connecting with wildlife photographer, Scott Logan, who is currently the naturalist at the Gottlieb Native Garden. He will be presenting a webinar on how planting California natives created a wildlife oasis. So that will be really great. Keep it, keep a, an eye out for our Zoom webinar. You can mark your calendars already. It's Thursday, January 14th at 7.30. So the same format over here. And just make sure to RSVP when you see that link available, okay? And for and anyone out there who hasn't seen the Gottlieb Garden, it's a joy to go through. And if you haven't had the chance yet, Come to the meeting and see it at least via the meeting because it's it's a it's a fun place, especially exactly. walking through all of the hummingbird feeders. It's like being in a giant beehive. <laughs> I can only imagine that Scott's photographs too, being a wildlife photographer, are going to be incredible as well. So the last thing we'll do before we get started, well, we keep going with our day will be our wheel of names. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we are going to get this ravel started. All right. So let's see who wins. Gloria! <laughs> Gloria, are you in? If you are still on with us, please raise your hand. Gloria, do I see you? Do I see you? Oh, I don't see Gloria. No. Okay, we're gonna try one more time. Let's see <laughs> if our next winner will be with us still. <laughs> All right, here we go. Maria B, are you here? Maria, if you are here, please raise your hand. I see you, Maria. All right, perfect. I have your email, so I will actually connect you to Steve so that you guys can exchange information for your new set of pruning shears and your rose, your guide to roses. All right, well, thank you everyone again for joining us tonight too. If you have to go, Please note that this will be recorded. This is being recorded and it will be posted onto our YouTube video within the next few days onto our YouTube channel. Wow. 
in the next few days and you'll always be able to find the whole live webinar on Facebook Live as well. So let's keep going with a few more questions. This one is from CJ Crockett. Is the Omri fertilizer you use a balanced fertilizer? Yes, it is. And the Omri listing just means that it's organic. That is, it's an independent certification board. And the, the rose fertilizers I use tend to be a, um, uh, like a 585 or something like that. So the numbers are fairly low. And if you look at the um, what makes up like just the nitrogen portion, there's about five different things on there and they break down at different rates, which is why I always say that if you're using organic fertilizers, um, you're looking at six weeks down the line from when you lay them down to when they're gonna become effective. And, and even that depends on the weather about how cold or warm we are. And this year we're pretty warm, so it's gonna be faster. Um, if just as I, I don't, I wasn't going to mention uh, uh, brands, but if you just happen to go to like Home Depot, uh, they sell Kellogg's and the Kellogg's organic rose food is actually, if I remember right, it's either the old, it might be the old Dr. Earth formula that they purchased and they're just producing it under the Kellogg's name now. So it's a really, it's a great the price is fantastic for what you're getting and it's a good product but there's a whole there's a whole mess of other ones out there too i'm not I, i'm just saying that's a for instance um if you want the easy way to do it this one's actually from maria b our prize winner i use worm tea is it good and how do i find out if my roses need pruning uh it depends on the rose um you can actually, there's a lot of good online uh, stuff about if your roses, roses need pruning and generally roses need pruning every year, um, some pruning. And on the ones that don't need as much that I mentioned, old roses, English roses, shrub roses, things like that. The way you know that they need pruning is that the color of the canes changes when they get very old and dusty gray looking you know that those are older than probably about five years, you may want to cut out that entire cane and let new canes form. But on a lot of those older roses and English roses, if you do hard pruning, you're actually ruining the structure of the plant. They build up canes and they bloom on shorter new wood that comes off of those uh, old canes, whereas hybrid teas and floribundas, it's the opposite. They're actually uh, blooming on new wood. So you do have to prune a little harder. I just tend not to prune mine as hard as some of the books recommend. And yes, worm tea is excellent. Don't overdo it, but it's excellent. And it will even, um, if, you, if you brew it lightly and not really strong, you can even use it as a foliar spray. So the plants will actually take in some of the nutrients as a foliar spray but then you should probably rinse it off too. Don't leave it just sitting on the plant. Uh, rinse it off after a while. The next one is from Francesca C. Do you even strip leaves off Lady Banks roses? Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you found out one of the exceptions to the rules. So that's a once bloomer, a Lady Banks rose. There's the yellow one, the, the pale yellow, and then there's the white Lady Banks. If it's the true white Lady Banks, there's also a a rose called the Cherokee rose that's sold as the White Lady Banks. If it's White Lady Banks, it'll smell like violets. If it's the Cherokee rose, there's no fragrance. All three of those, they do not need to actually have their foliage stripped. Um, it would be an endless process if you tried because they are gigantic roses at their best and the foliage is minute. If you want, you can actually get out your hose with a good high velocity nozzle and blast at the roses um, probably a, about mid-December uh, into sometime in early January and see if any of the foliage comes off by just blasting them. And that'll take off most of the old foliage and you don't have to bother with the other. They tend most, I don't know that I've ever seen a Lady Banks rose with foliage problems of any diseases whatsoever. They are, the, if for anyone who's been to Tombstone, Arizona, the largest rose in the world is there. It's a Lady Banks rose and it covers 
I think a half an acre or something like that. It's some, it's yeah. And it has <laughs> hundreds of thousands of flowers when it's in full bloom. So yeah, they are amazing roses. All right, the next one is from Carol B. Do you modify your maintenance program for container grown roses? Yes, um, I, I, and that's why I use the Osmocote as a fertilizer too. I find container growing with any plant I'm growing in container, whether it's a rose bush or a California native or vegetables or anything else, it's entirely different than the open garden. So yes, everything gets modified. And for me, for uh, growing roses in containers, first off, the, you need to put in a soil that's fairly heavy. It shouldn't be just pure potting soil. It needs to be about half planting mix and half potting soil because it dries out too too quickly if it's just pure potting soil. You need to water much more often. You need to feed on a regular basis, which is why I'll cheat and use Osmocote. But because I'm not relying on worms and other things, the mycorrhizal fungus and things, stuff like that, it's a whole encased artificial environment when it's in a pot. So it's not really, you're you know trying to do that organically. I will still feed them organic food, but I'll also put in Osmocote and do other things that aren't necessarily the same as the open ground. So yes, it's an entirely different process. And I'm tending away from it for the most part, uh, except where I can't and where I have to grow in containers. All right, this one's from Claudette Poole. Uh, sorry I missed when to use alfalfa meal and where to get langbanite substitute. Um, <laughs> Uh, good luck on either uh, right now. Uh, right, I've, I've just been buying all of the alfalfa meal out of all of the local nurseries. Literally, I've been packing my truck full of bags of alfalfa meal. You put on alfalfa meal right when you prune. Or, and if you can't, if you can't do it immediately when you prune, you can do it within the first month after pruning. So by mid-February, if you put this stuff down, you're still fine. And the Solpo mag, which is different, a, a, a different name than Langbanite, but they're both the same thing. They should be available at almost any independent nursery. Don't bother at the big box stores, they don't have them. If they don't have it at the moment at the nursery that you shop at, have them order it in for you. Because as I say, you don't have to have it on hand immediately, but it should, I tend to try and get it down on the ground within that first month of, of pruning and stripping for stripping and pruning. That's... All right, we're gonna take a couple more questions and then the remaining questions that we have not answered, uh, we will ask Steve to answer and then we will post again on our website a PDF of all of his answers. So this one is from Jason H. When you remove the foliage, do you use a tool or just by hand? Uh, that's, I think I talked about, I've mentioned that already. If it snaps off easily and with your fingers, I tend to, to, to do that. Some roses, I'll even do it barehanded if I'm brave enough and I'll pinch it with, with uh, fingernails. But otherwise, I'll use a tool and you generally want to use floral scissors rather than secateurs or pruning shears. You want to use that straight blade floral scissor and keep them very sharp. It's really boring, but on some roses, it just has to be done, which is why I say I tend to hire people to do it for me because it's, it, it's mind numbing. <laughs> All right, and our last question for tonight is going to be from Teresa D. What does side dress mean? How thick do you mulch? How close do you go to the base of the plant? Okay. Um, side dressing just means to put down anything around the crown of the plant where you, you know, where you feel that drip line is of where the, the roots are moving out to. So generally not right around that base, but out for a few inches where you know that the roots are growing and that when, when the material breaks down or when water hits it and draws it down into the soil that it's available to the roots. The mulch, as I said, I tend not to go over about an inch and a half, two inches deep. You might want to mulch more heavily in your garden. It depends on where you are and what your soil is like. I'm on heavy clay. I don't need to mulch as heavily, but, and then I also, I garden out, a, a gardening some roses out in the valley in a very hot garden. And I've put on probably three inches of a commercial mulch out there. So it's different on whatever different soil it is. And let's see, oh, and how close do I go to the, um, 
if I'm putting on a deep mulch, like out in the valley, I tend to actually taper it as I get closer to the plant. In my own garden, I mulch right up to the crown because it's not a problem. I don't mulch so deeply. And I tend to plant on my soil, my, I have heavy soil, I plant my crowns a little higher than the books recommend so that I can do this. I can actually mulch right up to them. It also allows me to kind of inspect a little bit better for problems. So um, I tend to plant a little high and mulch right up to it. All right, well, thank you, Steve. I'm gonna send you a list of the remaining questions so you can answer those at your leisure. And then again, Excellent. whenever we get your answers, we'll have them posted on our website in the past meetings webpage where you can see the YouTube recording of this as well. All right. Wonderful. Well, and everyone, thank you again for joining us. Happy Hanukkah for anyone celebrating. And remember to mark your calendars for Thursday, January 14th, when we welcome Scott Logan to our Zoom webinars. All right. Have and a good night, Steve. Happy oh, yeah. holidays for all the other holidays, too. Yes. <laughs> the holidays <laughs> coming up, too. All right, guys. Have a good night and keep on planting and growing. <laughs>